Welcome to the two-day international symposium on tunneling being organized by SJVN in collaboration with Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. I'm Kanika Malhotra, Manager HR from SJVN Corporate Office, Shimla, and it is my distinct honor to be your host for today. We are privileged to welcome a distinguished gathering of intellectuals and delegates from across the globe. Over the next two days, we anticipate an engaging, fruitful, and memorable exchange of knowledge and ideas during this international symposium on tunneling. Once again, welcome, and we look forward to a collaborative and successful symposium. Our chief guest is about to oh. arrive shortly. Over the next two days, I request all of you to kindly engaging. put your mobile phones on silent mode, please. Ladies and gentlemen, SJVN is a distinguished Mini Ratna PSU under Ministry of Power, Government of India, established in May 1988 as a joint venture of Government of India and Government of Himachal Pradesh, SJVN is currently involved in implementing and operating projects across various states of India, as well as the neighboring country of Nepal. Our vision is ambitious, aiming to be a 5,000 megawatt company by 2023-24, further growing to be 25,000 megawatt company by 2030, and reaching 50,000 megawatt by 2040. Our diversified portfolio encompasses hydro, thermal, wind, and solar power, reflecting our commitment to sustainable and inclusive energy development. Our venue for this enriching knowledge exchange, IIT Delhi, stands fifth among the 23 IITs established as centers of excellence for training, research, and development in science, engineering, and technology in India. This knowledge hub was founded in 1961 and declared as an institute of national significance in 1963. Before we start with the rich discussions planned for the day, here are a few important highlights. The program schedule for the day shall be as follows. The inaugural session of the International Symposium on Tunneling will commence with the welcome of our chief guest, Honorable Minister of State for Power and Heavy Industries, Sri Krishan Pal Gurjarji. This will be followed by the welcome of all the dignitaries present on the dais, followed by the lamp lighting ceremony. Following the lamp lighting ceremony, we shall have Honorable CMD SJVN, Sri Nandlal Sharmaji, gracing the dais for the welcome address. This will be followed by the address by Deputy Director IIT, Delhi, Professor T.R. Sri Krishnan. Thereafter, we shall have the address by our chief guest, and the inaugural session will culminate with a vote of thanks by the symposium chairperson, Professor G.V. Ramana from Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Delhi. Following that, we'll have a tea break, and then we'll proceed with the plenary lectures by our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Guest for the symposium, Honorable Minister of State for Power and Heavy Industries, Reverend Sri Krishan Pal Gurjarji has arrived. Please welcome our esteemed chief guest with a thunderous applause, ladies and gentlemen. 
जोरदार तालियों के साथ स्वागत वंदन और अभिनंदन करें हमारे आज के चीफ गेस्ट का आई ऑल्सो रिक्वेस्ट सी एम डी एस जेवीएन श्री नंदलाल शर्मा जी अलॉन्ग विद चेयरमैन बी बी एम बी श्री मनोज त्रिपाठी सर जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी एम ओ पी श्री मोहम्मद अफसल सर प्रोफेसर टी आर श्री कृष्णन प्रोफेसर जी वी रमना एंड चेयरमैन बी बी एम बी टू काइंडली ज्वाइन एस ऑन स्टेज प्लीज अ वॉम राउंड ऑफ अपलॉज वंस अगैन लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन फॉर आर चीफ गेस्ट इट इज अ प्रोफाउंड ऑनर एंड अ वेरी ग्रेट प्रिविलेज टू एक्सटेंड अ वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल द एस्टीम डिग्नेटरीज एंड डिस्टिंग्विश्ड डेलीगेट्स हु गैदर्ड इन द इंटरनेशनल सिम्पोजियम on tunneling today this collaborative effort by sjvn and iit delhi is truly honored by the presence of eminent personalities from various domains on this exquisite morning it is with immense joy and honor that i extend a warm welcome to our chief guest for today's program honorable minister of state for power and heavy industries revered shri krishnpal gurjar ji two lines for our honorable minister netritva aisa hota hai jaise pragati ka vichar hota hai netritva aisa hota hai jaisa pragati ka vichar hota hai aap aaye aaj is jagah तो ऊर्जा का संचार होता है एक बार पुनः जोरदार तालियों के साथ अभिनंदन और स्वागत वंदन हमारे माननीय मुख्य अतिथि महोदय का अ स्पेशल वेलकम टू ऑनरेबल सी एम डी एस जेवियन श्री नंदलाल शर्मा जी द आर्किटेक्ट ऑफ टूडेज इवेंट यू गाइडेंस एंड लीडरशिप हैव बिन इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन ब्रिंगिंग ऑल ऑफ आस टूगेदर टूडे अ वॉम वेलकम to our other dignitaries on the dais we have shri manush tripathi ji chairman bbmb shri mohammad afsal ji joint secretary mop professor t r shri krishnan deputy director iit delhi along with the chairman of the symposium professor g v ramana from department of civil engineering iit delhi in this august gathering a very special welcome to our distinguished speakers who are renowned national and international experts in the field of tunneling along with our respected delegates who are present here from various esteemed organizations your presence today signifies a gathering of the brightest minds in the industry poised to share invaluable experiences and insights in the field of tunneling and last but certainly not the least a warm welcome to all the sjvnites faculty members of iit and all the iitians present here today as we embark on this journey of knowledge exchange and collaboration let us collectively make the most of today's symposium ladies and gentlemen over the course of this two day international symposium an array of plenary keynote and industry lectures shall unfold delving into the latest technological advancements in tunneling and underground infrastructure development recognizing that infrastructure development and the availability of reliable electricity are fundamental prerequisites for driving economic activities this event assumes paramount significance tunneling as a crucial element in infrastructure development and hydroelectric power generation becomes the focal point of the discussion the symposium's thematic core emphasizes the imperative of constructing underground tunnels particularly crucial in the challenging himalayan terrain together let us explore 
the frontiers of knowledge, paving the way for advancements that will shape the future of tunneling and underground infrastructure development. Before starting with the day's proceedings, let us first acknowledge the presence of our eminent dignitaries seated on the dais. Atiti Devo Bhava, Kehti Ye Bharat Ki Dhara, Swagat Karke Aapka Nibha Rahe Hum Parampara. In the honor of the distinguished presence of our chief guest, Honorable Minister of State for Power and Heavy Industries, Revered Shri Krishan Pal Gurkar Ji, may I request Honorable CMD SJVN Shri Nandal Sharma Ji to first and foremost welcome Honorable Minister by presenting a symbolic representation of Himachal Pradesh's heritage, a muffler, a Himachali topi, expressing our deep respect and gratitude for our chief guest's presence. Ladies and gentlemen, a resounding applause once again for our chief guest for the occasion. I'd also re request CMD sir to kindly present a sapling to our chief guest, symbolizing our respect and commitment to sustainable practices. Let us once again <laughs> applaud this gesture warmly. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Director Projects SJVN, Sri Sushil Sharma, sir, to kindly come on the stage and welcome Honorable CMD SJVN, Sri Nandal Sharma ji. A round of applause once again, ladies and gentlemen, for our visionary and exemplary leader of SJVN, Sri Nandal Sharma ji. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Sushil, sir, to warmly welcome Chairman BBMB, Sri Manoj Tripathi, sir, in today's symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Sri Manoj Tripathi ji, Chairman BBMB. Punha zordar taliyon ke saath swagat kare hamare sabhi dignitaries ka seated on the dais. Thank you so much, sir. I request, sir, to kindly present a sapling to Manoj Tripathi, sir. May I now request Executive Director S. Chivyan, Sri V. Shankar Narayanan, sir, to kindly come on the stage and welcome Sri Muhammad Afsal, sir, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Power. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Sri Muhammad Afsal ji, Joint Secretary, MOP, with a thunderous ovation. Request Shankar Narayanan, sir, to kindly present a sapling to our Joint Secretary, MOP. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Executive Director SJVN, Sri S. Maraswamy, sir, to kindly come on the stage and extend a warm welcome from all of us to Deputy Director IIT Delhi, Professor T.R. Sri Krishnan. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Deputy Director IIT Delhi, Professor T.R. Sri Krishnan ji. SJVN, along with IIT Delhi, has collaboratively <laughs> organized today's symposium. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Now, may I request Executive Director SJVN, Sri Pavan Varma, sir, to kindly extend a warm welcome to the chairman of the symposium, Professor G. V. Ramana, from Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Delhi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is only with the collective efforts of IIT Delhi, under the guidance of Professor Sri Krishnan and Professor Ramana, in collaboration with SJVN, 
that has been crucial in shaping the symposium and making it a reality. A resounding applause once again for this remarkable talent pool seated here gracing the dais. As we commence this enlightening journey of knowledge and collaboration, it is only befitting that we initiate it with a symbolic gesture of profound cultural significance, the lighting of the lamp. In the spirit of inaugurating our symposium, on an auspicious note, I humbly request our chief guest, Honorable Minister of State for Power and Heavy Industries, to kindly illuminate the lamp seeking the choicest blessings of Ma Saraswati. I also request Honorable CMD S. Jivyan and all the dignitaries on the dais to kindly join in the lamp lighting ceremony. Chalna hai hame andhakar se prakash ki or. चलना है हमें अज्ञान से ज्ञान की ओर पृथ्वी से आकाश की ओर पदार्थ से सूक्ष्म की ओर प्राणी से परमात्मा की ओर वी प्रे फॉर योर ब्लेसिंग्स विद ऑल ह्यूमिलिटी गिव अस द विस्टम टू मेक दिस वर्ल्ड अ बेटर प्लेस मे ऑल ह्यूमन बीइंग्स live in harmony with nature and other forms of life may the truth prevail it is often said that where there is light there is no darkness emphasizing the extraordinary power of light to dispel darkness as we embark on the symposium celebrating the intertwined pillars of knowledge and experience sharing. These facets serve as a guiding beacon for progress and development. In the presence of our distinguished dignitaries, it is now my great honor to request Honorable CMD S. Shivyan, Sri Nandlal Sharmaji, to kindly grace the dais for the welcome address and set the tone for today's symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome CMD S. Shivyan Sri Nandlal Sharmaji with a thunderous applause. Superbhat, good morning. Honorable Chief Guest of the Function on International Symposium on Tunneling, Shri Krishnapal Gujarji, Honorable Minister of State of Power and Heavy Industries. Shri Mroj Tirpathi Ji, Chairman BBMB, Muhammad Afzal Ji, Joint Secretary, Hydro Ministry of Power, Professor T.R. Krishnan, Deputy Director, IIT Delhi, Mr. G.B. Ramana, who is in charge, Chairperson of this symposium event, all the delegates from India and abroad, directors of PSUs, delegates from various PSUs and other private concerns, ladies and gentlemen present over here. Against the backdrop of a recent tunnel collapse in Uttarakashi, Silkyara Barko Tunnel, which was being constructed to link Yamunotri and Gangotri 
ಹೈವೇ ಚಾರ್ ಧಾಮ್ ಹೈವೇ ಈಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಕನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ ದ ಲೇಬರ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ವರ್ ಟ್ರ್ಯಾವ್ಡ್ ದಿಯರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಸೆವೆಂಟೀನ್ ಡೇಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಯರ್ ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಇವ್ಯಾಕ್ಯುಯೇಷನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಿಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸಿಂಪೋಸಿಯಮ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಟರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ಯೂಮ್ಸ್ ಮೋರ್ ಸಿಗ್ನಿಫಿಕೆನ್ಸ್ this was not planned post this event this was planned about 6 uh, months back when ministry of power desired that uh, let the ministry of power come forward and lead an interactive event or discussion or debate on this issue of tunneling tunneling is not only done in power sector tunneling is done in uh, ministry of road uh, road transport transport highways metro and in the defense ministry also and other concern, other entities of the government of india and other private concerns also tunneling is being done and uh, we should all come together discuss the challenges and find out the solutions and this event of uh, uttarakashi road uh, this tunnel collapse has uh, at the right time given uh, this challenge and come together and discuss how should we go for the with the tunneling it is my pride privilege to welcome the distinguished guests present over here in this gathering for the two days under the guidance of ministry of power sgm is organizing this international symposium in collaboration with iit delhi iit delhi is a premier institute in the field of technology and we as a partner with iit are going ahead with this organizing this event our aim is to bring together experts industry professionals researchers and associated stakeholders to brainstorm upon the challenges solutions and latest developments in tunneling and underground space works in india tunneling in the form of underground passes has always been part of our history also in dwapar yuga the time of mahabharata the lakshagri the escape route which was planned by pandavas through a secret underground tunnel we also find references of underground tunnels as secret escape route to the old forts palaces located all over the country and afterwards during british era underground tunnels became a crucial part of many of our rail routes whether we see the rail route from kalka to shimla or to darjeeling or uh, many other places we can find the tunnels and those tunnels were constructed more than 100 years back also and in the present times tunneling and underground works are an important part of power projects railways and roadways projects mining water supply and sewerage system metro networks and infrastructure projects harnessing of hydropower potential across the world involves hundreds of kilometers of tunneling and underground caverns this constitutes a substantial percentage of overall project development cost and is very critical in the overall execution of the projects tunneling has an impact on the economics and viability of the projects also and viability of the things as a whole also for example we construct tunnels for the constructing national highways this shortens the distance also and this saves the fuel because if we take the longer distance longer mileage for the vehicles to move 
that is the wastage of fuel also. When we construct tunnels to shorten the distance, it saves the time as well as fuel, which we import crude oil, which we import from other countries. And uh, its significance in the field of hydro, nobody can uh, deny this fact. Earlier when the uh, hydro projects were only storage projects, there was very minimal or no tunneling at all. There was underground work only for the construction of the, say, underground powerhouses, but no tunneling, headrest tunnel or like that. But afterwards, when in the storage projects, there was a lot of displacements, rehabilitation, and it uh, became very difficult to develop the hydro projects, particularly with the pondage, with the large pondage, with the storage, like Bhakra Dam, Tihiri, or Hirakun, like that, like these projects. There were a lot of uh, displacements, migration, and rehabilitation issues be associated with these projects. But subsequently, we are that run of the river projects came into uh, picture. And for the run of the river projects, underground tunneling uh, became significant. And for this, uh, we, can, uh, we cannot forget that uh, for this 1500 megawatt uh, Nathwa Jhakri hydroelectric project, which is still the largest uh, hydro projects in the country, 27.4-kilometer uh, underground tunnel, hydrace tunnel was constructed. Similarly, for other projects which are run of the river projects, lot of tunneling works. And similarly, for metros, underground tunneling, for mining work, all, for all these things, tunneling is involved. We have seen that a number of projects in India have been delayed due to thirst and shear zones. When we go for underground works, earthwork, or tunneling, we encounter diverse geology. Even geology changes within 5, 10 meters also. This is diverse geology. There are challenges in the tunneling. We encounter uh, their shear zones, thirst, and uh, heavy water ingress also. Hot temperature conditions, we have seen that we were excavating tunnel, Nathwa Jhakri tunnel and for the Rampur project tunnel also. We, were, we, have witnessed, we have seen, we have observed, experienced that on uh, right side of the tunnel, there was very uh, cold water of temperature of, say, near to 5 degree or 10 degree. On the other side, the hot temperature of 60 to 65 degree Celsius. So this is the variation. The hot temperature, they were difficult to work inside the tunnel under such hot temperature conditions. And the workers, they used to work with the help of the ice uh, logs only for two hours. So such is the difficult uh, condition of, for working uh, in these underground works. And this is the, it is a need of the hour to accumulate and assimilate as such knowledge as possible on prevalent practices and experience gained in this field. As Jivin has also vast experience in the field of tunneling and uh, we have done and we are doing a tunneling of more than 100 kilometers in various projects, India in India and abroad. As even if I introduce that, uh, it's one of the CPSCs uh, under Ministry of Power, and we are in diverse fields now. Uh, our portfolio is quite diverse, uh, hydro, wind, solar, thermal, uh, in India and abroad as well. We have a portfolio of more than 56,000 megawatt, and our target is to make company a 25 gigawatt company by 2030 and 50 gigawatt company by 2050. So we are in this direction, successfully under the guidance of the ministry and the technical associates like Central Electricity Authority and various other experts and specialists and consultants in this field. As and when we get some difficulty, we approach all the consultants and experts in this field. The excavations which have been done during uh, the tunneling, method of tunneling, we use the conventional method of uh, uh, DVM, uh, drill blast uh, methodology. 
and uh, the other techniques like using use of TBM, uh, tunnel boring machines. At some places these are successful, but whereas in other places these are uh, not successful, where the geological conditions of, of are of very diverse nature because TBM uh, are not in a generalized fashion; they are customized by a particular bug. And when geology, uh, varied geology is encountered, sometimes these TBMs uh, are not that successful. Uh, but in other countries, what we have learned and we have, what we have read, that uh, if such challenges arise, how to tackle, how to handle such challenges. We all know that the tunneling projects face many such challenges. SGVN has been part of the excavation team during the various rescue operations. This uh, Uttarkashi tunnel collapse, SGVN uh, took a lead at its own. We have sent a team of 15 persons there on the site just after two days. And my team of uh, experts, uh, constituting of field specialists, field engineers, geologists, and uh, designers, they were on the site. They helped uh, the rescue team on all the fronts. And specifically, SGBN was also assigned the task of vertical hole, doing vertical hole, hole of 86 meters. Uh, this was initially deferred because that horizontal hole, which was being done with the help of that auger, that was uh, successful for the initial uh, days. And at that time, that vertical hole, hole was put on hold. But at one place, at one time, when it was found that there were many difficulties uh, in, the, in doing that uh, horizontal hole, we were given go ahead for uh, this vertical hole. And in a period of uh, around uh, 30 to 32 hours, we did vertical hole of uh, about 44 meters, having one meter dia. And all of you know that from the media also that uh, what, uh, horizontal hole, which was uh, having some difficulties, first initial between the 20 and 25 meters, but uh, when some uh, hard rock or some steel material was there, that was addressed. And subsequently, after 25 to 40 meters, there was no issue. But after 40 meters, again, the auger faced, uh, faced some issues. And after 48 meters, uh, auger, uh, blade of auger broke down, and it, it was difficult. And at that time, as Sivin was given go ahead of a vertical hole, but with the help of uh, rat miners, that uh, extraordinary do uh, job of uh, excavating the remaining, what, 14 meter hole was, uh, horizontal hole was done. So SGVN was associated in this, not only this, in 2015, September 2015, again in one of the projects of National Highway on Chandigarh Manali National Highway near uh, uh, Swarghat at a place called Tira uh, Tunnel, that underground tunnel also collapsed. And at that time also SGVN sent its team of three experts, geologist, designer, and uh, uh, field engineer. That team was sent and that team uh, helped the people there to evacuate uh, two persons which were trapped inside the tunnel after nine days. So SGVN has experience of such rescue operations and finding out the solutions for uh, such difficulties. I strongly believe that around the world, the focus of tunneling and underground works industry is shifting more and more towards sustainable and uh, environment-friendly tunnel construction projects and devising future technologies in, the, in this field. The focus is on adopting cost-effective and modern technologies for tunneling to reduce capital expenditure and without compromising on the safety aspects. Another demand of the present time is to reduce the construction time of power projects by adopting efficient and modern tun tunneling construction keeping in mind the diverse geology and topography of the region. This symposium is our attempt to provide a platform to learn and share the knowledge by experts who have rich experience and expertise in relevant areas. I will say 
that uh, number of questions have been raised or being raised and will be raised on the methodologies being adopted for the construction of the tunnels at the preparation of the DPR or any project. Cost of question is at the forefront. Everybody demands that cost should be minimum. But when there comes the question of safety, at that time people say that you should have taken this mayor, you should have taken that mayor like that. One of the persons during this uh, mishap or encounter suggested that we should put one meter dia or 90 centimeter dia pipe always in the tunnel for the escape or we should construct escape tunnel for the safety of the persons. But if we do that or if we incorporate it at the time of the preparation of the DPR or the cost of the project, the cost of the project goes, goes exorbitantly high. And then project is appraised. Then it is said that project is highly cost intensive and it's not viable. But when such events arises, people come forward and suggest that this, should, this measure should have been taken. So such cases or mishaps are very rare, not only even 1% cases. Though we should take all safety precautions, but at the same time, we are supposed to have cost-effective and viable projects minimizing the cost also. And again, the technology. People argue that we should go for the tunneling with extensive support system. There are guidelines, international guidelines, but kind of support system be there depending upon the geology. When the rock is good, there is no need of support. When the geology is poor, we should have the support system ranging from lattice girder to raves and like that. And it is very difficult for the people also there how the geology behaves before pre-construction of the tunnel and post-construction of the tunnel. Sometimes we see that during the construction of the tunnel if geology of say class 3 or like that uh, that is a very thin layer of uh, classification, whether it needs support system or not, or what kind of support system. But later on when tunnel, this, uh, this tunnel was also being excavated for the last four years, there was no such instance of uh, fall or collapse like that. And uh, after that, when such incidents occurs, people say that it should have been done, such measures should have been taken. So this is a debatable question. And what methodology of tunnel construction should we follow? Whether it's a drill blast method or tunnel boring machine or any other hybrid uh, mode. So this is the platform where not only from India or not only from the public sector, but also from the private sector and experts from other countries also. This is the platform that we should discuss, we should interact with each other, with each other and uh, share the experiences and come out with the suggestions, come out with the takeaways, what kind of uh, methodology we should use, we should go for tunneling. I once again take this opportunity to thank uh, Honorable Minister of State, Shri Krishnapal Gozerji, who spared his valuable time. Uh, to be among us, uh, us and uh, guide us and uh, bless us with his uh, blessings also. And uh, special thanks to renowned speakers who have come from various countries, various institutes. I also again thank uh, all the delegates. 
and overall i thank uh, iit delhi also for collaborating with us to throw uh, this idea and discuss on it and a congenial environment and conducive environment uh, to discuss on this uh, very important issue i extend warm welcome to each one of you and being a part of this international conference enjoy your your particip participation in this conference and have a memorable time here in new delhi thank you very much thank you so much sir for your enlightening address may i now request deputy director iit delhi professor t r shri krishnan to kindly address the esteemed audience gathered here today ladies and gentlemen a round of applause for professor t r shri shri krishnan ji <clears throat> namaskar good morning to all of you honorable minister of state for power shri krishnpal gurjar ji cmd sgvn shri nandlal sharma ji chairman bmbf b BBMB Shri Manoj Tripathi ji Joint Secretary Ministry of Power Shri Mohammad Afsal ji all the symposium participants a warm welcome to you all to IIT Delhi IIT Delhi is a premier engineering institute of our country our government has termed it named it also as an institution of eminence and with that labeling also comes the responsibility of rising up to the technological needs of the society and finding solutions for challenges thrown up by the society or the mankind though not an expert on the topic of tunneling i do realize that it is a very important aspect whether it is power or infrastructure projects such as maybe the metro or hydel power projects tunneling is important and i think this i am sure that that is a one of the primary reasons why iit delhi has uh, come together with sjvn to organize this two days international symposium i hope that these two day deliberations by all of you and exchange of ideas and uh, other discussions term so to be fruitful and we rise up to the occasion of of course now tunneling is something you know we had been reading about this for the last couple of weeks the front line headline of all the newspapers papers still i think till 27th of november it was only tunnel so one of course it is not that tunneling is always a hazardous thing i am i i do know that tunneling has a major impact on various infra projects so i hope that these two del deliberations works out to be fruitful and once again welcome to all of you to iit delhi and for this two day symposium thank you namaskar thank you so much sir for your kind words ladies and gentlemen our chief guest needs no introduction however it is my honor to share his brief profile with all of you revert shri krishan pal gurjar ji was born on 4th february 1957 in mevla maharajpur faridabad haryana he graduated from jawaharlal nehru college and earned his law degree from merit university he began his political journey by winning the corporation councilor election in 1994 as a bjp candidate subsequently becoming the party's state minister shri gurjar ji served as member of the legislative assembly for three consecutive terms in 1996 2000 and 2009 in 2014 and 2019 he became a member of parliament having held eminent positions of minister of state for road transport and highways 
shipping, social justice and empowerment. In his current role as the Honorable Minister of State for Power and Heavy Industry, Government of India, his significant contributions continue to impact our nation positively. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor and privilege to invite our chief guest to grace the dice for his address. Mananiya Kendriya Bhari Udyog Evam Urja Rajya Mantri Ji Ka Zordar Taliyum Ke Saath Swagand Kare. I request sir to kindly grace the dice, please. दो दिवसीय सेमिनार के उद्घाटन सत्र में हम सबके बीच उपस्थित जीबीएन के सीएमडी श्री नंदलाल शर्मा जी चेयरमैन बीबीएम श्री मनोज त्रिपाठी जी चेयरमैन आईआईटी दिल्ली श्री जी रवन्ना जी हमारे विभाग के जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी मोहम्मद अफजल जी आईआईटी दिल्ली के डिप्टी डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर टी आर श्री कृष्णन जी और इस कार्यक्रम में आए हुए सभी अतिथिगण देवी और सज्जनों देखिए मैं तो राजनीतिक शास्त्र का विद्यार्थी रहा हूं और मेरे सामने आज जो बैठे हैं सभी ये तकनीकी विज्ञान के लोग हैं तो उसके बारे में तो आप जो विशेषज्ञ आए हुए दो दिन उस पर चर्चा करेंगे सुरंग के विषय पर कि क्या क्या उसके सामने चुनौतियां हैं उनका समाधान भी आप लोगों ने निकालना है तो इस विषय में मेरे को हाँ अगर राजनीतिक शास्त्र पर कोई पॉलिटिकल भाषण होता तो शायद उसमें हम विशेषज्ञ हो सकते हैं लेकिन इस क्षेत्र में आप सब लोग विशेष जानकारी रखते हैं मुझे आज के इस कार्यक्रम में आकर बहुत खुशी हो रही है और देश और दुनिया के इस विषय से संबंध रखने वाले जो स्पीकर हैं आज सब मेरे सामने उपस्थित आप दो दिन उस पर चर्चा करेंगे देखिए मैं समझता हूँ आज आदरणीय नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने जो संकल्प लिया है कि दो तक भारत को दुनिया का विकसित राष्ट्र बनाना और जब भारत को विकसित राष्ट्र बनाना है तो हमको दुनिया के जो पैरामीटर्स हैं दुनिया के जो विभिन्न जो क्षेत्र हैं हर क्षेत्र में वो आज कहाँ खड़े हैं हमको उनसे के बराबर आकर खड़ा होना है तभी अपना भारत विकसित भारत बनेगा और ये दो दिन का जो सेमिनार है ये इसमें बहुत बड़ा उपयोगी सिद्ध हो सकता है विस्तार से टनलिंग के बारे में हमारे नंदलाल जी ने क्योंकि इनका रोज वास्ता पड़ता है इस क्षेत्र में काम करते हैं सारी बातें विस्तार से बताई हैं और देखिए जैसा इन्होंने कहा इस टनलिंग के कारण समय की भी बचत होती है ईंधन की भी बचत होती है और सफर सुरक्षित भी रहता है दुर्घटनाएं नाम मात्र की होती हैं आप देखते हैं हम पहाड़ी इलाकों में जाते हैं इंडिया में जाते हैं तो हमको ऐसे ऐसे जाना पड़ता है और हम दुनिया के जो विकसित रास्ते हैं वहां जाएं तो हम पहाड़ों में से सीधे टनल के रास्ते ऐसे चलते हैं मुझे भी कई देशों में जाने का मौका मिला है और जब ईंधन की कम खपत होगी तो कार्बन उत्सर्जन भी कम होगा लेकिन हर देश की अपनी अपनी भौगोलिक स्थिति है हर देश का अलग अलग मौसम है और भारत में तो मौसम भी कई प्रकार के हैं 
यहाँ सबसे ज़्यादा गर्मी भी पड़ती है सर्दी भी पड़ती है बरसात भी होती है बर्फ भी पड़ती है उन सब में से हमको रास्ता निकालना है और भारत में ये अच्छी तरह से टलने का भी हमने देखा कि अभी सनियारा में जो हिमाच उत्तराखंड में जो हमारे इकतालीस मजदूर फंसे किस तरह मोदी जी के नेतृत्व में भारत की सरकार ने हर विभाग में उनको सुरक्षित बाहर निकाला तो इस तरह की समस्याएं हैं और पावर के क्षेत्र में तो जो हमारे जितने पावर प्रोजेक्ट हैं जो हाइड्रो के हैं उनमें बगैर इसके काम भी नहीं चल सकता चाहे पहाड़ों में रोड बनाने का काम हो उसमें भी सुरंग चाहिए मेट्रो लाने का हो तो उसमें भी सुरंग चाहिए ज़मीन के अंदर हमारे यहाँ तो अभी एक मंजिल है हम अगर लंदन में देखें तो तीन तीन मेट्रो चलती हैं ज़मीन के अंदर मतलब ये सब चीज़ हमारे सामने हैं और उन्हीं में से हमको रास्ता निकालना है दुनिया में एक से एक बेहतरीन टेक्नोलॉजी आज उपलब्ध है इस क्षेत्र के विशेषज्ञ आज हमारे बीच में सामने भी बैठे हुए हैं लेकिन इन चुनौतियों के बीच में से ही हमको समाधान भी निकालना है कि तेजी से टनलिंग का काम कैसे चले कम से कम समय लगे तो मैं ज़्यादा नहीं कहना चाहता सिर्फ इतना कहना चाहता हूँ कि आप सब लोग आए हैं तो इस पर विस्तार से चर्चा होगी क्योंकि देश के जिस भी प्रधानमंत्री जब मोदी जी ने तय किया है कि भारत को विकसित राष्ट्र बनाना है तो उसमें आप सबकी भूमिका भी बहुत बड़ी रहने वाली है हर किसी की भागीदारी इस विकसित भारत के लिए बहुत जरूरी है टेक्नोलॉजी भी लानी है अभी हमारे हर विभाग ने पीआईएल स्कीम पीएलआई स्कीम शुरू की हैं दुनिया की बेहतरीन से बेहतरीन टेक्नोलॉजी अपने देश में लाना तो मुझे सिर्फ इतना कहते हुए कि आपका ये जो दो दिन का सेमिनार है ये टनल के क्षेत्र में बहुत उपयोगी सिद्ध होगा और जो समस्याएं आज हैं जो चुनौतियां हैं निश्चित तौर पर आपके इस सेमिनार में आपकी इस चर्चा से उसके समाधान के नए रास्ते भी निकलेंगे इसी अपेक्षा के साथ मैं आप सबको और इस सेमिनार की सफलता के लिए मैं बहुत बहुत बधाई देता हूँ शुभकामनाएं देता हूँ माननीय केंद्रीय भारी उद्योग एवं ऊर्जा राज्य मंत्री जी का प्रेरणादायक संबोधन मिला हम सबको आपका सादर आभार सर एज वी कंक्लूड द इनग्रल सेशन ऑफ टुडेस सिम्पोजियम मे आई रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर जी वी रमना द सिम्पोजियम चेयरपर्सन फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियरिंग आई आई टी डेली टू काइंडली कम फॉरवर्ड टू डिलीवर द वोट ऑफ थैंक्स फॉर टूडेज इनग्रल सेशन अराउंड ऑफ अपलॉस फॉर आर चेयरपर्सन सिम्पोजियम वेल गुड मॉर्निंग डिस्टिंग गैस लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन डिग्नेटरीज on the dais so a brief background about the seminar as narendralal ji pointed out this was not an offshoot of the recent tunnel collapse we have been planning this for about 6 months and the genesis for this was starting a tunneling institute at iit delhi that is how we started off this and about iit delhi 
we have a very rich tradition in rock mechanics and engineering. I'm sure most of the people know Professor T. Ramurthy sitting in the back, who started Yamtech in rock mechanics way long back. Please give. And now, keeping in change with the times, we moved it on to rock engineering and underground structures. So this is a brief about it. And I extend my sincere gratitude on behalf of IIT Delhi and SJVN for gracing the inaugural session. And I sincerely thank Shri Krishan Paul Gujjar Saab, Honorable Minister for the State and Power for opening the, starting the ceremony and for lighting the lamps. A special thanks to Professor T.R. Sri Krishnan, Deputy Director, who facilitated with so many facilities by giving special one-time permissions. And also, the presence of these guests enrich the ambience of the seminar. We are grateful to our collaborators, SJVN, for their partnership and support in making this symposium a reality. Your commitment to advancing the field of tunneling is evident, and we are privileged to have you as collaborators, and we look forward to seeing a tunneling institute being started at IIT Delhi through Ministry of Power, NHAI, Ministry of Road Transport, and SJVM. And a heartfelt thanks to all the distinguished speakers who sort of acceded to our request at a short notice and travel all the way from Denver to enlighten the participants. A very special acknowledgement to Professor Ayoti Ramandir and Professor Shirole, the students' seminars and the organizing committee for their meticulous planning and tireless efforts in bringing this event to fruition and your dedication to ensuring this experience for the participants is truly commendable. Thank you again, sir. And let us embark on these two days of collaboration, knowledge exchange, and innovation, and let's hope that all this will culminate in starting a tunneling institute at IIT Delhi. Thank you, everyone, and over to Monica. Thank you so much, sir. In conclusion, we once again extend our heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Minister of State for Power and Heavy Industries, Government of India, and other dignitaries for their benign presence today. I request all of you to kindly proceed for tea outside of the seminar hall in the central square. Kindly proceed once our chief guest has left the venue. Thank you so much, sir. I also request all of you to kindly reassemble after half an hour at 11.30 a.m. Thank you so much. Barton, and for those people who work in tunneling, he needs no introduction. But it is my pleasure to read very few lines about him. Dr. Barton is an international rock engineering consultant with 50 years of experience in rock mechanics and engineering projects in 41 countries, to be precise. Now, he's the boss of his own company, and uh, he developed the renowned system, Q system, and most of the undergraduates in civil engineering who, took a who will take a basic course, they will encounter this term. And we are fortunate to have Dr. Barton with us. He has authored or co-authored over 400 publications, including two books on tunneling and rock quality. And if I keep reading his credentials and the awards, you will get bored. But the most notable one is 
सिक्स आई एस आर एम म्यूलर अवार्ड एंड ई हीज आल्सो ए फेलो ऑफ आई एस आर एम इंटरनेशनल सोसाइटी ऑफ रॉक मैकेनिक्स प्लीज ज्वाइन मी इन गिविंग हेम ए राउंड अपलास Okay <clears throat> good morning everybody uh thank you for the honor of opening the session somebody has to start so they chose me yeah but it could have been many of many of the invited guests um i just correct downwards the number of publication it's more like 350 not 400 i don't think i will reach that number but we will see so you see the title of the lecture um The Q system, of course, is an empirical method, and it was based on a lot of case records that were available in the mid 70s, let's say, early 70s. Quite a lot was from Norway, quite a lot was from Sweden, others from other parts of the world. It was dominated by hydropower in the beginning, and then later on, thanks to my cooperation with Ostein Grimstad, who many of you know, a lot of road tunnels. were involved some 1000 road tunnel cases was the basis of uh, an updating that you'll see from 1993 so after some time we realized that we were doing things a little bit differently to other countries we we were combining the best of bolting and shotcrete with use of the q system so we thought why we don't call it something let's call it nmt nice competitor for NATM you'll hear people batting for the other side tomorrow i think who will talk about NATM is it not loud enough i don't want it to go kind of boom boom right so uh tomorrow you'll hear people talking about NATM in glowing words today i'm going to talk about NMT in glowing words so uh excuse to NATM aficionados and uh, those who are sympathetic to the Q system then you will perhaps enjoy concentration on NMT so this is the basic content of the lecture it is directly comparing NMT and NATM and you see a sort of definition as as we go along let me get the right glasses on <clears throat> so there will be some emphasis on overbreak which is a, a problem for NATM but not really for NMT because we don't fill the overbreak we spray into it but we don't fill it yeah and there'll be talk about water control the different methods that are used in in these two different techniques and uh, also talk about rib rin for shotcrete arches rrs as an alternative to lattice girders and also you'll see the relative costs and time of applying nmt as compared to natm roughly speaking yeah so i've had a, almost a lifelong cooperation with eystein grimstad he joined us at ngi from the norwegian road authority i think it was uh in the mid 80s yeah after i came back from the usa four years in the usa and he was uh, the master of of collecting a lot of case records from ro- mainly road tunnels yeah and also some work in india as you know in nathbiakri and also in china so the q system as a brief as possible introduction we use it down where the rock is jointed and uh q means quality or perhaps lack of quality there's those six parameters and very roughly speaking it's like relative block size into block shear strength and something like active stress <coughs> and we use the q system because there's millions and millions of possible rock masses not just five or six like on the gsi diagram but there's millions and millions of potential rock masses and it's helpful if we can put some numbers on this instead of trying to vainly in vain perform large in situ tests which which wouldn't be representative 
So just to give you a feeling, those who are not so familiar with Q and are more familiar with RMR, there's, there's a huge numerical range for Q, which is a very big advantage, actually. Um, it's at least six orders of magnitude. And this is helpful when you think of the huge range of, of rock mass properties. If it was deformation modulus, shear strength, cohesion, permeability, I mean, orders of magnitude for those different parameters. So it's, it's very logical. You should have a huge range to represent rock masses. For me, it's not logical to have a 5 to 95 range for RMR or GSI. It's much more logical to have a very big numerical range. And then the equations to represent some of the key parameters, they're much more simple because of that big range. Um, on the left are the, the spread of case records that I collected for the 1974 publication. And you can see they, they reasonably spread from like 0 0.01 Q value on the left right across to about 100, yeah? So this, this, this is quite a solid area of, of case records. Some people have said you should only use Q in the sort of harder jointed rock area, but we, we do use it for a, a wider range. And actually, one of the largest consortia of contractors ever assembled, or nearly all the English contractors, nearly all the French contractors, called TML, Transmange Link, who drove the channel tunnel, they used the, the Q system without any influence from me. About 10 years later, I found out the work they'd done, and I was making a comparison, and I think they used it in a very reasonable way, yeah? even though they were TBM tunnels. <coughs> so the frequent assumption of those who think they know best is that the Q system only applies to typical hard jointed rocks but we actually make wider use of Q in NMT, the Norwegian method of single shell tunneling. And the original case records, as you see in a moment, they included 50 different rock types. And this was only something like 210, 212 case, cases. So already 50 different rock types. And I chose deliberately uh, challenging cases with clay bearing joints, shear zones, faults, and so on, because you can't develop a classification method just on very good rock. Yeah, you have to have a big range of, of rock support. So those are the range of rock types in these first uh, 212 case records, actually. Now there's, first of all, another 1,000 case record, and then by now about 2,000 case records that have been included in these recommendations. And again, the, the huge range, of course, it spreads into core logging. So there we have something close to 0 0.001. And on the other extreme, it looks like 1,000. But actually, it's a borehole that's missed vertical joint sets in Hong Kong in granite. And you, you get completely incorrect classification and, and testing results. You, the permeability would be completely wrong, of course in relation to a rock mass with three joint sets. <clears throat> so you have to be careful about the orientation of, of drilling. Uh, interestingly, this is the statistics for about 40 kilometer of core logging by engineering geologists at a mine, in a, a gold mine. And you see there the the range of RQD as you go from a, a better quality Q 10 to 40 on the right, and 4 to 10, and then the, the bell-shaped one is Q about 1 to 4. It's, it shows a very nice kind of sensitivity to the poor rock that was developed by Deere, yeah, when he invented RQD. And uh, there are some quite logical things in the Q system, I think. One of them in particular is the ratio JR over JA, which is very similar to friction coefficients. I didn't design this. It, it, it came from the case records. I recognized it when I was writing up the paper, actually, in 1973. So for unfilled rock joints and also slightly clay-coated rock joints, you, you get quite a nice correlation with with friction coefficients, and I've, I've matched this to in-situ tests. 
in some cases in China, yeah, where they've done a lot of in situ shear tests. And we have a, a logical sort of scale of roughness, much more clear than the joint condition factor in RMR, because you're just looking at one parameter, JA also, yeah? Um, if we move on to the, the, the sixth parameter, the SRF, traditionally we expect to have sort of stress, strength problems or maybe strain burst problems when we reach a tangential stress as much as 0.4 of UCS. And then we would, we would expect elevated values of, of SRF. But actually, thanks to some recent work by Baotang Shen, when you reach a tangential stress of about 0.4 UCS, you're actually you can equate this with the ratio sigma t over Poisson ratio, the tensile strength divided by Poisson ratio, uh, and that is equivalent to, to what's happening, yeah? That you get extension failure, and then if there's enough energy, you may get shear failure and, and rock bursts. So we can replace this 0.4 UCS by sigma t over nu. Um, People who are designing bridges, they can choose the stones that they do this with, but we have in common the fact that we're, we're relying on a tangential stress and a radial stress, yeah? An arching stress and a, and a radial stress going in towards the opening. And uh, the rock quality and the stress levels, they determine how much help is needed in the case of a tunnel in much more challenging rock masses which may have clay filled joints and faults and so on. So do we believe NATM based support is needed or, or can we choose a more economic NMT? And that will be kind of the, the subject of the, of the lecture. So two definitions first of all. We, we refer to NMT as single shell. We might use pre-grouting and one could use, of course, pre-grouting before NATM also. If we have to absolutely control the inflow of water. The basic elements are systematic bolting B and SFR, the fiber reinforced shot creeds. And we might use RRS, rib reinforced structures, rib reinforced uh, shot crete arches, which we'll see photographs of soon, if the rock quality is very, very poor. And basically, we need a small workforce, maybe one-tenth of what we see in a tunnel being driven by NATM. We may just see one or two or three workers at the face of a Norwegian tunnel. They're there with a big shotcrete robot. Someone comes in with concrete, and that maybe doubles the number of people at the face for a while. Double shell NATM, <coughs> the temporary support may be fiber or, or, shot, or mesh reinforced shotcrete, bolting, steel, or, steel arches or lattice girders, and then the permanent support, it has a drainage fleece and a membrane and the cast concrete. And inevitably it needs a, a larger workforce, perhaps 10 times the number that you see in NMT. So these single shell methods of SFR plus B for the NMT. They're actually used in all the world's hydropower generation caverns, more or less, I would say 99.99%. All the world's oil storage caverns, mine access, there's thousands of kilometers every month of mine access that are driven in the main mining countries. But in other excavations like road, rail, and metro tunnels, there's obviously a decision to be made. Do we choose NATM? It's as expensive, but perhaps it's reliable, we'll see. Or do we choose NMT, which is cheaper? What about the, the concrete, the CO2 footprint, yeah? Much, much less concrete is used in, in NMT. Uh, NMT operations as an, as an initial summary. So we have those basic three components. The most frequent is fiber reinforced shotcrete and, and systematic bolting with different spacing and different thickness, of course, as we see. And some of those diagrams, they show you what I'm talking about. So drilling and blasting, mucking, uh, scaling, 
Q-logging, these are actually two engineering geologists, one from the contractor, one from the owner, maybe the consultant, yeah, and they're supposed to come to an agreement of, of, of the, the rock quality, and what support will be needed for the next round. We call it the owner's half hour, actually. It's a formal thing that half our hour is allowed to record the, the quality that's just been exposed by the last blast of five or six meter. And then there will be the robotic application of the fiber in for shotcrete, the bolting, and maybe cladding in the case of a road tunnel. So we have a, a, a well-supported tunnel, an air gap, and then PC element lining elements that are bolted through a, a membrane on the outside. That's if we're allowed to have water coming to the tunnel, but we have a dry roadway or a dry railway. If water is not allowed, then we do the pre-injection before all those stages. Uh, we, we rely on the bolting as permanent support, so we use something called the CT bolt. This is just a, a demonstration half meter length. Obviously, they're three, four, five, six meter length according to the tunnel size. And uh, there's a sleeve of PVC, and there's an annulus, an inner and an outer annulus of, of grouting, yeah? So you can actually, we'll see in a moment uh, another picture of this, what happens if there's some deformation near the bolt. So our fiber in for shotcrete, it looks like this, and we, we spray right up to the, the face. So we see already a four, maybe a four meter advance here. It's quite a big tunnel. Uh, we don't like mesh reinforced because it's very difficult to bend the, the mesh into the overbreak. And you get a shadow effect. These drawings from Van der Waal, they're very realistic actually. You, you don't have corrosion in this case except at the right of the surface. You do, you do have electrolytic corrosion possible when you have the continuous mesh. So preliminary design is based on field mapping, drill core logging, and, and seismic interpretation. And the final support is selected during tunnel construction, during that uh, half, this uh, owner's half hour, yeah? And it's based on tunnel logging and use of the Q-System support recommendation to, to decide is this class one, two, three, four, et cetera. And maybe some numerical modeling has been done previously to see the stability of the plan support for these different classes. But in general, the numerical modeling is more likely to be for the caverns, where it's easier to be. I mean, the cavern is a more stationary affair, and you've got more time to do numerical modeling. You cannot do that when your tunnel is advancing 50 or 75 meter a week. The permanent support usually consists of high-quality, wet-process, fiber-enforced shotcrete, and fully grouted corrosion-protected rock bolts. Actually, I first saw fiber in for shotcrete in 1979 in a hydropower cavern in Western Norway. And I wasn't very convinced about, can we rely on something like this? But I was then four years in USA. And when I came back in 84, I didn't see any more mesh reinforced shotcrete. It was just fiber reinforced. And uh, so we've been using fiber reinforced wet process for like 40 years in Norway, yeah? at least 40 years. <clears throat> Concerning the contract, the owner pays for technically correct support. It's kind of a lean design because we're, we're, we're looking at the needs for each tunnel advance, yeah? And the needed support is based on the agreed Q value and may vary frequently. So if we need RRS, we're in this area of the Q support diagram, just the left-hand side. This is cast concrete. If it's really bad, this is where we would use the RRS. And the RRS looks like this. The key thing is it's got the standard, needing f the, the standard need for radial rock bolts may be down to one meter spacing. They may be four or five meters long. And uh, uh, a rib of, of shotcrete is built up with fiber in for shotcrete. And uh, the, the bolt is installed. There's a, a T-bar here and uh, maybe 16 millimeter bars can be bent into the shape. It can even tolerate an overbreak. It doesn't have to be an absolutely circular thing like a lattice girder. So the RRS can, can bend somewhat into overbreak, which, which is another way of saving the amount of shotcrete or concrete. And uh, you can have double layers of the, of the bars. This is what it looks like in a, 
a 20 meter span station cavern on one side. It was very poor quality, so they had to have a pillar at first that was removed. And here, in a kind of in a nutshell, or in a, a design desk, or an office desk, I've, I've summarized some of the operations of NATM, of NMT, excuse me. The rock mass characterization, maybe the correlation with seismic, and the different support options, some numerical verification in certain cases, the concentration on the robot technology and the contract system, low cost, rapid advance, etc. <coughs> so these photographs are from the robotic shotcrete rigs that were already being used about 30 years ago. They're from a brochure about 1992, a contractor's brochure. AMV is the company, Anders Mechaniske Werksted, Anders Mechanical Workshop, yeah. They're making these, they're still making these uh, very high capacity rigs. They can spray between 15 and 25 cubic meter of shotcrete per hour. And uh, they can be electrically or, or diesel driven according to the power that's available in the tunnel. And they can serve several tunnels, of course, driving between projects or several projects on several tunnels on the same project. Yeah. And the operator is high up, able to see the quality of his work, yeah, which is an advantage. And this is jumping ahead a little bit. The last picture was from 30 years ago. This is some of the, the latest results from uh, testing of Dramix, 25 cubic meter or, excuse me, 25 kilo per cubic meter or 35 cubic meter, 35 kilo per cubic meter shotcrete with Dramix or the equivalent of the PP fiber with six or eight kilo per cubic meter. There's a little bit larger fracture energy in this case. The residual seems to be a little bit higher than with the steel. So, as we saw, this is what the NMT tunnel may look like. The shaley limestone has, has actually been pre-injected, and if you do a really good pre-injection job, you, you really improve the rock quality. So, in effect, the standard Q-system design seems to be a bit conservative. The bolting in the first layer of shotcrete, it's applied close to the face, and following the Q-system logging, then the latest advance gets support. So NMT is basically safe, and it's as economic, it's, it is as economic as possible, yeah? We're not using more shotcrete than we need, not more concrete than we need. The CT bolts, obviously you're using bolts because it's jointed rock, and there may be a stability issue when you do the next blast. So the bolt, where the bolt crosses a joint, the joint may move slightly, a fraction of a millimeter in the next blast and your outer annulus would be cracked, logically. Normally this would come next to the bolt. Here you have a PC sleeve and an inner grout annulus and epoxy coating, epoxy painting and galvanizing of the bolt. So there's still four layers of corrosion protection left. So we can really rely on these, these CT bolts. And we rely on the steel fiber, stainless steel fiber reinforced shotcrete as well because of the lack of corrosion. <clears throat> An important part of queue system, of course, is that we can do queue logging beforehand, rock exposure logging. It's very important if there's, there's quite a lot of weathering, you're not going to see a good example of the rock unless you're looking at deep rock cuts, for example. This is an example from a, a rail tunnel and from one of our TBM tunnels, the Follabam. And in the bottom left there, you see part of my logging of, of the southern part of this Follabarn and TBM tunnel. About nine kilometers of the tunnel is represented there by some 150 rock cuttings in the area. And the, the Q statistics there, you see the RQD, the red, and the brown is the number of joint sets represented, and the, the dark brown is the JR distribution, yeah? So there's some few thousand of observations here. 
that were made for each of these tunnels. So please note the following. The Q-system-based B plus SFR reinforcement and support was never designed to accommodate or rely on lattice girders, which are far too soft. We'll see the reason for me saying that in a few minutes, since they're unbolted and they're likely to be unevenly loaded. And the single shell Q-based tunnel design was also never intended to allow the passage of water at high velocities, such as 10 meter a second river diversion compared to the case record expected sort of two to three meter per second of typical head race and pressure tunnels. So if you use one of these tunnels for river diversion at high velocity, you need to be very careful with the invert and you need to beef up the Q support recommendation because of the, the high velocity. Yeah? You may get erosive problems. You will get erosive problems. <clears throat> so NATM operations as an initial summary, this is from directly from official uh, Austrian documentation. I think it's been colored by, uh, from ILF, it's been con colored by one of their consultants, yeah? And you see the top heading operations in the top diagrams and then the benching down and you can kind of imagine that quite a lot of people are going to be involved in an NATM tunnel because there are a lot of, a lot of operations inevitably. Um, on the next diagram, I'm going to show again these upper diagrams here and I'm going to draw in a little bit of overbreak because there's overbreak, right? We, we, we don't really get such smooth excavations as this in reality. So if we put in some overbreak here, you see immediately that it's likely NATM is going to use more shotcrete and or rock or, or concrete to fill this overbreak because they're going to have a final concrete lining by the time they bench down and they're casting in the arch. Yeah? So there may immediately be many times larger volume of concrete and or shotcrete in NATM because in NMT, we, we just spray into the overbreak. We, we, we maybe have five or 10 centimeter into this overbreak. We don't need to fill it, which is very important. We get a very stable tunnel combined with rock bolts. If we do this, we don't need a, a circular arch to have tunnel stability. Just keeping all the blocks together with shotcrete that looks like this is very, very effective, yeah? <coughs> Sometime I've been in NATM tunnels and I don't get very much feeling that people are worried enough about the stability of the lattice girder stage. There are the lattice girders being held up temporarily by a, a long plank. And there was actually an event in this channel tunnel crossover cavern. We, we were in the tunnel, tens of thousand, 10,000 workers were probably in the tunnel and there was suddenly a 40 millimeter event in this cavern because of water pressure in the joints in the arch and they had to drill some release pressure release holes so it's not until you get to the final wonderfully stable looking concrete line stage and by the time you use a lot of concrete that you you really can feel stable that you're in a stable situation so relative cost of nmt and then ATM. This is a picture of one of the high speed rail tunnel connections to the Channel Tunnel in southern England through jointed chalk. <coughs> chalk is 30, 40, 50 MPA strength. And it had a final year 2000 cost of about 130 million, so say $40,000 per meter. And at that time, this was about three to four times higher than a typical NMT tunnel, because I, I costed an alternative to this at the time, so that's why I know these numbers, with a similar Q value using typical B plus SFR as the permanent rock support. And if you, if you use the Q system in a, in a slavish way and you go through different tunnel sizes there, I've got 50 square meter, 90 square meter, 130 square meter, this is uh, tunnels connected with a, a motorway abroad. And uh, our typical NMT 
quality area, a range of Q is typically in this area here. So these different tunnels, if they had overall a Q value of this value or this value or this value, the cost is gradually rising. And uh, if, we, if we're in really poor rock, also we would use concrete in the Q system. But NATM is using final concrete as if it's really poor rock, which it may not be. So automatically NATM is going to be several times more costly and take several times, several <laughs> years more to construct than an NMT tunnel, logically speaking. And these are actually, that was empirical data that I, I, I costed for these different Q values, the different sizes of tunnel. This is actually direct observations of about 50 kilometers of tunnels performed by a colleague of mine where they show the relative time and the ratio is 10 to 1. 10 to 1, yeah. The relative time and the relative cost 12 to 1. If you're moving into lower Q values, your, your, cost is, your time is increasing, your cost is increasing. Here, there's very little support, so the, the, the cost is kind of a constant there. The cost of transport, the cost of blasting, and so on. So how does overbreak influence NMT and NATM? It influences it in a very different way, of course. So those are extreme examples of overbreak, of course. and. Uh, if you could accept this as a final lining with shotcrete and more rock bolts, this would be a much cheaper solution than if you had to fill those several meters with, with shotcrete and concrete, needless to say. In fact, they, they had to do that because this was a metro station. Here, the, the excavation is actually, you could say, the, this tunnel is being driven in the wrong direction in relation to the overbreak. Yeah? It's along the axis of a powerhouse. It's, it's not a good decision, but there was other reasons for it. So we'll spend a few minutes on overbreak because it's an, an interesting concept, and I'll mention it also tomorrow because it, it, it cannot really be part of continuum modeling that I'll talk about tomorrow, continuum and discontinuum modeling. So this is in a mine. <clears throat> and there are two major joint sets, J1, J2, and the yellow. And here I was asked to kind of do queue logging and do sketching of the overbreak that I observed in these long hole drilling tunnels. They were going to do long hole drilling and blast out these stopes in this mine in northern Sweden, LKAB. And uh, these are some of the sketches I did of the overbreak. This is the RQD, JN, JR, JA statistics, statistics. And if you look carefully at the most frequent, there's no special reason for this very big overbreak. But if you take some extreme values of JN and extreme value of JR, plus some help from JA, you can explain why you have this strong overbreak. So actually, I found later that JN over JR more than or equal to six is more or less a geologically caused overbreak that a contractor cannot be blamed for. He cannot be blamed for, for tough blasting, for example. It's difficult to avoid the overbreak. <clears throat> so here I have the scheme. You see the six uh, roughness profiles. We don't need to say exactly what scale that is. Let's say it's a half to one meter scale roughness. And uh, if you have three sets, if you have, let's, excuse me, let me back a little bit. If you have two sets, two plus random, three sets, three sets, three plus random, four sets of joints, but with sufficient roughness, JR of three, for example, this one here, you don't get overbreak. If, on the other hand, you had two sets plus random, three sets, three plus random, four sets, with not quite so much roughness, say this one or this one or this one, you, you would get overbreak with those cases, because we, we have this ratio of six or more, yeah? <clears throat> this is just a, a quick glimpse at mining, which is quite interesting. So I was shown this by uh, a researcher at CSIRO in Australia when I gave a course in 2005, I think it was. 
and he was looking at uh, Potvin and Matthew's stope design criteria, where they use the first four parameters of Q, and then they use uh, some an A, B, and a C factor to do with the hydraulic radius and the stress strength ratio, etc. So he, he was able to plot it on this histogram method, on this uh, matrix method. He was able to plot the typical position of caving or mass failure. And if you look carefully, you'll see that JN on its own, JA on its own, JN over JR, they are all quite close to explaining caving. So already three or four of the Q parameters are, are rather good at describing whether or not there's likely to be the characteristic for caving, in other words, cheap mining. Yeah? <clears throat> Those two tunnels up there, believe it or not, that would be the remaining roughness. The, this is the, the top heading of a, a motorway tunnel in rather poor rock, and maybe it'll have one more layer of shotcrete. It's got systematic bolting already. This is a, a rail tunnel in Sweden. They use the Q system there, and this is the final roughness of the tunnel surface. Believe it or not, yeah, for those of you who like to have a, a nice smooth concrete lining using 10 times more concrete. And this also is the top of the Yervik cavern. The over, we're looking maybe 30 meters into that arch. There's probably one meter of overbird, uh, one meter of uh, over excavation there, yeah. So the overbreak is at least one meter in, in this area. And the average thickness of shotcrete in this big 62 meter span width arch was 10 centimeter. It was actually 98 millimeter measured from 400 cord holes. So it's just 10 centimeters of measuring of fiber reinforced shotcrete and rock bolts according to the Q system. And it's the case record right at the top of this diagram here. The range was like two to 30. So I think these cases here, they're showing that we don't need a continuous sort of nice smooth arch to give tunnel stability. If we keep everything in place, the rock itself will give you a nicely retained tangential stress and be very stable on its own. So again, I've taken the liberty here of drawing in some potential serious overbreak on an otherwise very nice looking NATM finished road tunnel. The reality maybe, or nearly always, is a larger volume of concrete or shotcrete because of overbreak. <coughs> you have those two options exactly compared there. So control of water in NMT and NATM. We have this option to do pre-injection. Of course, that option is available for NATM tunnels as well if you're not allowed to have any drawdown of the water table because of overlying clay deposits and the city, for example, above your head. Then we need to do very good pre-injection, maybe limiting inflow to one to two or three liter per minute per 100 meter, something like that. In other words, like 10 minus nine meter per second. So this pre-injection, it takes 24 to 30 hours to drill about one and a half kilometer of injection holes, the screen, the umbrella, using triple boom jumbos. And, uh, and, the, and the grouting of the, each of these holes can be, can be performed in those 30 hours, yeah? And you end up with something, a, a dry tunnel, more or less 100% dry tunnel. The, those are some pictures of uh, drilling for the next round. This is the injection round. This is showing spraying. There's a guy up in this uh, shot greeting robot rig here, halfway up the boom, and he's spraying this area at the moment, and he's going to spray all this area here. So there's already five centimeters shot greet, and there's going to be five here, and then later there will be 10 centimeters, the final shot greet covering the bolts. <coughs> And you may be able to see some chains there. This is chaining the, uh, 
the Packers together. And this is the picture of the almost dry tunnel. With NATM, you have difficulty if there is overbreak. You have this uh, non-uniform fleece, the non-uniform 3D surface for the fleece and the membrane. And you can imagine the, the different thicknesses of concrete there. Worse still, if you're going to use the, this principle in a cavern, you, you, you see complications that are just not seen if you're doing regular NMT. So lattice girders, steel sets, RRS, a few words about this is important. The lattice girders that you see there, they're quite robust. They're, 75, they're 35, 32 millimeter, 25, 25. And uh, it's a structure sort of about this size, yeah? And here it's uh, steel arches on the right side. It's actually a very soft system and it can be unsafe when you're waiting for the, for the concreting. So the, these are interesting five-year monitoring results of an experimental tunnel in mudstones. And you see the very successful few millimeter of just rock bolts and shotcrete, sprayed shotcrete al alone and rock bolts alone and steel arches alone. So this change of gradient here was when converting, when, when, invert, when spraying the invert, yeah? To complete the, the stability of the tunnel a little bit more thoroughly. So the, the, the choice is rather obvious, the bolting and the shotcrete as compared to the steel arches. <coughs> On a radio support pressure diagram, radio deformation, this combination that we've chosen is something like this. Bolting alone is something like this. Steel sets, you may have actually an implied increase in SRF, some loosening, yeah? So you have to ask the question, do you have adequate footing for lattice girder? Do you have uh, resistance when they're point loaded? It's very difficult to make really good contact with the lattice girder. And uh, what about yeah, contact with the tunnel surface and, and their own deformability as well. So they have to take a strain before they start resisting. So you're kind of inviting deformation if you use lattice girder. And do we think uh, steel arches are the best solution? I think both these maybe are from Nathby Akri. This one definitely is. So there are other solutions to, to steel arches, yeah? Where, if you look carefully, this is in the bottom of a, a granite quarry, and there's some small people there. So you see the scale of these large joints, minor faults maybe. Imagine the differential loading that could be on lattice girders when you cross a, a, a feature like that. And indeed, this very robust lattice girder that we saw just now, that's what it looked like after an unexpected vertical load from a, a ridge of rock that nobody knew was there above the cavern a tragic uh, metro accident in Sao Paulo about 15 years ago. And this is also a, a sad story about uh, NATM. So the designers assumed uniform horizontal surface, uniform conditions, isotropic, elastic, etc. The reality was actually that there was a uh, some variation in the terrain, and immediately that caused a, a difference in the, the deformations. And when the actual vertical loading from some phyllite was added into the equation with a dike, then a failure was, was predicted by UDEC BB. This is modeling that my colleague Stavros Bandis did. And he also did uh, three deck modeling and in the end, all of a sudden, in a Saturday afternoon, luckily there was nobody there, the 140 meters of the tunnel collapsed. The, shot, the, the lattice girder just collapsed. There was no bolting. And this is what it looked like when a second tube, they lost another 140 meter of this NATM tunnel. Yeah. Okay. I think I started at uh, 10 to, right? Okay. I'm getting close, yes. So the RRS in NMT, it's much more robust than lattice girders. Of course, it takes more time, but all stages, you get more support. And we're using the rock as a construction material. 
So this is from my colleague uh, Grimstar. This is a kind of a more complete RRS diagram than the one you may have seen in uh, an NGI brochure, uh, excuse me, an NGI uh, handbook, as they call it. So this is allowing for the fact that you have tunnels of different sizes and you need RRS of, of different sizes. So the left-hand side of each, each uh, little box of information is the relevant Q value, yeah? So concluding remarks in the form of figures and photos, apropos reducing concrete use. So even in Austria, someone decided to use single shell for this uh, large machine hall. And uh, even in England, somebody decided that they finally could use fiber reinforced shotcrete in over-consolidated London clay, something we'd been suggesting they could do like 20 years earlier. 30 years earlier, I think, in the uh, Jubilee line extension. So finally it was used in 2010, yeah? So there's no reason to not use fiber in for shotcrete and rock bolts in a, an excavation that's much smaller than those two excavations you've just seen. And I'm just showing some final pictures from the Yervik cavern, from the, the logging of Q, in these boxes, these are the different Q values actually logged by uh, Rajin Nabasin, uh, a good colleague of some of you, and a friend of mine from NGI. And some of the numerical modeling that was done, this is the support that was used, some temporary anchors and the standard uh, uh, CT bolts as the permanent support. And the deformation was a stable seven, eight millimeter, the same as, the same as calculated with UDEC BB modeling. <coughs> so conclusions, NATM and NMT tunnels, they're based on radically different use of resources with maybe five to 10 time differences in concrete volumes. We don't need to fear overbreak with NMT, it's a bigger problem for NATM. Well-executed pre-injection is more reliable than membranes. Beware of the risk in the lattice girder stage of NATM. This was written years ago, long before what you've experienced in India in these last weeks, yeah? In NMT and NATM, preliminary support should be appropriate to the rock conditions as logged on site, not preconceived and, and, and uniform. So with NMT and the Q system, final support also matches the rock. So thank you for your attention. And uh, that's it. Now I request Professor G.V. Ramna to extend our gratitude for the insightful lecture by Dr. Barton by giving a moment to, as a token of appreciation. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. By Professor Mate Gutierrez is a distinguished professor and director of Center for Underground Transportation Infrastructure at the Colorado School of Mines. He has also worked at NGI for about 11 years, and he has so many research papers and invited lectures. To his credit, he is also a recipient of 2011 Geotechnical Research Medal from Institution of Civil Engineers, and 2017 ARMA Award, and 2020 Rock Mechanics Research Award, both from American Rock Mechanics Association. And also in 2016, Peter Kundal Honorable Mention. So please join me in giving him a warm round of applause. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Um, 
It's such a great pleasure to be invited in this uh, symposium and to be able to visit uh, this uh, prestigious institute. Also nice to be following Nick, who was a, a colleague and mentor at NGI before I moved to the US. Okay, um, about a year ago, there was a big buzz on the release of Chat GP3 by AI. Uh, no, no, by Open AI. Um, it is now being said that AI will produce uh, very profound effects on human civilization. It could be good, it could threaten our existence. Nobody could say, even the developers of AI themselves. At any rate, uh, we should try to use this technology uh, in different fields, and particularly, I think, tunneling. Now, my work is on machine learning, and it's not really AI, but machine learning is a big part of uh, artificial intelligence. Okay? Art uh, artificial intelligence tries to uh, mimic human intelligence and in performing tasks with efficiency, but while machine learning is something nothing really more than uh, processing large amount of data and, and obtaining uh, data and information from them. Okay, um, well, let me give you a very short introduction of what uh, machine learning is based on my own uh, limited knowledge of the technology. Uh, we say that um, developing computer programs as until now is still the bottleneck for the use of models, numerical models. It's the computer modeling that is the most difficult task. But what if we could let the data you do the work instead, okay? In other words, let the computers generate the programs themselves. So a formal definition of machine learning is that it is programming computers to optimize performance criterion using example data or past experience, okay? so. If we com uh, compare traditional programming with machine learning, in traditional programming, we have a black box, which is what we call a computer program. We provide the input and we get an output. Okay, and as I said again, this blocks, black box is a major uh, endeavor. In machine learning, we have a set, a, part, a, a partial set of data where we have both the input and the output. Then we use the computer to learn from both the input and the output, the relationship between input and output, and come out with a computer program. That is the machine learning. And then apply it to a different set of data from there on. Okay, so mathematically, uh, the definition for, for, for machine learning is that we have a function, a predictive function. We have an image feature, which is our data that we are using to train the machine learning and we have the expected output. What we do is to train the machine learning algorithm using a set of data. This is what we call the training set. And once we have trained it, we apply it to a testing set of data. That is an entirely different set of data that we haven't used in the training. That basically is machine learning. So let's look at uh, image processing. Image processing is one of the greatest applications of machine learning. Um, machine learning is now beating radiologists and looking at images of tumors and identifying whether the tumors are cancerous or not. It's beating humans, okay? So that, that is just one. Uh, let's look at the image detection using machine learning. So we have a set of data comprising of apple, pears, I don't know, whether it's tomato and different types of animals, okay? And then for each of the data sets, it's the groups I, I prescribe features. For example, apples should be rounded, and horses should have four legs, for example. Then I train the data using labels. For example, I tell the computer that a horse has four legs while an apple is rounded. And then from there on, using all these characteristics, uh, I will have a learned model. Then I can test it now. Okay, and then my machine learning should be able to tell me, whoa, show it an image, and then the image will say, well, this is an apple. Very well and good. 
But there are some limitations. You may be able to show it an imperfect data, which in this case I show an apple with a worm. It might still work, it may not. But if the data is completely out of range, you show it a banana, which it hasn't seen before, it will tell you like Manuel in the, uh, that very quirky and very funny British uh, uh, TV series, Faulty Towers. Manuel says, okay, I'm from Barcelona, I know nothing. Basically, that's how it's going to behave. Okay, so what are the steps in uh, machine learning? First, we gather the data, which is actually the most expensive part and time intensive part. We prepare and clear the data, because the data certainly will contain spurious and anomalous uh, data. We select the most appropriate machine learning to technique. You don't have to develop one anymore, because there's tons of them available out there. Train the model using a subset of your data, validate and improve the model, and then deploy the model. So we, had, we have four types, basically four types of machine learning. What is called supervised or in, inductive learning. That is, uh, we train the, the computer with data and both the desired output. And supervised means we just give it a training data. We don't know, we don't tell the computer what are desired outputs and let the computer figure out what are the outputs. We have semi-supervised and we have reinforcement learning. That is, we reward the, the machine learning by going back and telling the computer, yeah, you're doing well, this is how you should proceed. So this is an example of spectrum of unsupervised and supervised. To the left, I have a set of images of humans, cars, koalas, and I'd like the machine learning to classify the different images. Second one, in the weekly supervised, I tell the computer which one are humans, just show it the figures of humans, koalas, and cars. But in the fully supervised model, I actually tell the computer what are the features that make a human? A human's gonna have a nose, two eyes, and a mouth. A koala is gonna have an elongated uh, ear, and a car will have doors and wheels. That is a fully supervised model. And we have different techniques depending on data are continuous or discrete, and we could do both supervised and unsupervised learning. So, it's anywhere from classification, clustering, regression, and dimensional re reduction. Okay, there are now, as far as I know, about 200 uh, variants or types of machine learning programs out there. Okay, about 200, as far as I know, that's a lot. Um, which one to use? Um, this is the problem. Uh, there is a theorem out there, no free lunch theorem, by Wolpert in 1936, which says that you can't just use an ML or machine learning algorithm, uh, and one cannot prepare one over the other without making assumptions and actually testing how the models work. Okay? Uh, but given that, there's actually one uh, machine learning uh, 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 algorithm that has proven to be very powerful from the very beginning and it was uh, proposed by John McCarthy, the so-called father of AI, and that is artificial neural network, particularly if you have a proper backpropagation uh, algorithm. So determining which ML to use is perhaps the biggest problem, but there are already tons of programs available out, out there, mostly written in Python, uh, like TensorFlow, and, and MPAC. These are open libraries that you could use. Now, why use uh, machine learning in underground construction and tunneling? Well, we, have, we deal with enormous amounts of data from monitoring, that is, we monitor the tunnel. Uh, this data supposedly should give us understanding of response and of the ground and the support. The data are typically nonlinear. They're noisy. They contain a lot of noise. And they are high, of high dimensionality. High dimensionality means, you know, uh, quantities, for example, force is a low dimensional quantity, but stress, which is force divided by area, is a higher dimensional quantity. Um, the data should speak about the complex physical me meanings, okay? That may, uh, but this, this evolving this data is a very challenging part. Uh, strictly, we could do a so-called data-driven modeling. Data-driven analysis is another tool of AI. Um, 
and we need it to m uh, utilize uh, uh, tunnel monitoring data sets um, and probably try to help the tunnel operator, the TBM operators, to control the TBM to minimize problems. Okay, so again, ML hopes to identify patterns uh, for predictive modeling and tunneling. Uh, let me give you an example. A major tunnel in China. Uh, this, was, uh, this data was provided by my colleagues at Tongji University in Shanghai. So anyway, this is a water conveyance star, uh, tunnel that connects, connects two major rivers, Yinma and uh, Chalu rivers. Okay? Um, that is in the Jilin province, northwest of China. If you look down, this is the uh, lit uh, lithology, the main rocks that are encountered. The tunnel is 7.5 kilometers in length, again, uh, uh, connecting two rivers. It was ex excavated by an open TBM with about eight meters of diameter. The major rock types are limestone, granite, uh, tophaceous sandstone, diorite, and carbonate. Carbonaceous shell, shell slates, or rather, uh, the t the tunneling of uh, encountered 27 difficult geological areas, such as faults and caves, which resulted in 53 extension of the construction period. Okay, uh, the data were corrected at different frequencies. Um, the TABM data are uh, collected in real time, uh, and a total of about four point. 0.8 uh, billion data were collected with a maximum of about 800,000 da data points per day. That's about one pentabyte of data, okay? One pentabyte of data. In the TBM operating systems, there were 199 channels, including operating time and propulsion parameters. Okay, again, this is the, the lithology along, the geology along the length of the tunnel, limestone, diorite type, and granite. Uh, these are the different, uh, I don't know if I can try this. Okay, this, these are the different lithologies and the different lengths. Okay, so the most is some limestone and granite, so for to total of about 20 kilometers. And uh, the percentage that is the, the excavated by TBM is given here. The other sections are excavated by drill and bus, for example. The rock mass, according to the Chinese classification system, range from type 2 to type 5. UC is about 38 to 95, and joint module of about 4 to 23 uh, fractures per meter. So on the right-hand side, I, sh I will show you the, the, the different lengths okay? and the number of collapses. These are collapses. There were 18 instances of collapses. Okay? Um, Collapses constituted disintegration or collapse of blocks on the tunnel boundary due to presence of weak or unstable materials, fault zones, karstic instruction, and that are encountered along the tunneling alignment. Okay, uh, the TBM. This is the operating data. These are the characteristics of the operating data. Those are the parameters that are. Uh, those are the TBM parameters, including diameter um, and other uh, uh, measures of the TBM performance. Uh, the TBM had 90, 199 sensors. And in this machine learning, we use 70% of the data that's been gathered, the one pentabyte data. We use 70% of it to train and 30% to test, okay? All right, this is a typical um, data that is collected Okay, during the, the TBM cycle, so different uh, epochs, different uh, measurement epochs that is measured in center. Where there's a, you can see that the data consists of up and down portions. Go up, go down, go up, go down. Now this up and down uh, uh, trend of the data is simply because the, the TBM was stopped, something was done, and then it goes up ramp again until it continue. Now this, this, this down and up trends were deleted from the machine learning because we want only the performance of the TBM during the drilling process itself. We look at data, it's important to look at the statistical data 
the how it is uh, distributed, the diagonal parts are the distributed parameters. Let me go back, by the way. I think I went too fast. Okay. I, I missed this one. The TBM parameters that we use are the torque, rotating speed, uh, advancing speed, propulsion, uh, thrust of propulsion, and the performance parameters that we use to measure the performance of the tunnel are the penetration index, torque index, and specific energy, and of course the geology. And these are the definitions of the of the different uh, performance parameters: FPI, TPFI, and ES. And with those, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven parameters. We train the machine learning using different algorithms. The three models that we chose was multiple regression, support vector machines, and random forest. And what we hope is that by looking at the data, the machine learning should be able to tell us when the TBM is operating normally, when it encounters a collapse zone, and an influence zone that could be a predictor for an upcoming uh, collapse zone. Okay, so as I said again, this is the typical measurements of the data going up and down simply because the operation is paused and resumed afterwards. It's important to look at how the data are distributed. The diagonal uh, elements here are how each of the parameters are, are distributed, very close to normal, but also to look at cross-correlation between particles. You will see, for example, that PR, penetration rate, is directly correlated with advance rate. That's a good correlation. Now, the reason for looking at cross-correlation is to be able to reduce the space parameter, the hyperspace parameter. So, for example, instead of seven parameters, we might be able to reduce to eight parameters because we could obtain one parameter from the other parameter to cross-correlation. Or we could use the cross-correlation to predict that indeed such cross-correlation exists. And as you will see, the cross-correlation before, uh, for normal zones, zones that uh, proceeded uh, normally during the TBM, are much different from the uh, cross-correlations for tunnel sections that have collapsed, okay? Uh, what he's saying is that there is probably limited numbers for which the tunnel can collapse and need limited number of parameters that could predict collapse compared to normal operations, which could have multiple ways to happen. All right, so as I said, we use three models, MLP, SBM, RF, and again, we have to remember, and don't forget the pre -lunch, no free lunch model uh, theorem, we have to try to test as many machine learning algorithms as there are. Fortunately, somebody has already done these studies before for similar problems and found out that our app, Random Forest, Support Vector ma Machine, and Multilayer Percepton are very good uh, machine learning algorithms. So this is uh, how, for example, a, a multilayer Percepton algorithm is is formulated. It is nothing more than a two-layer backpropagation uh, neural network. Neural network, of course, tries to uh, model how the brain functions. Our brain consists of uh, neurons, which are interconnected. Okay, so we try to do that. Um, uh, it can handle uh, complex and nonlinear data. Uh, it says it's two-layer backpropagation neural network. Uh, the neural connections pass the output from a previous layer to be input to the next layer, okay? Uh, we use weighted sum to pass through an action. That is, we use, for example, uh, hyperbolic tangent. Uh, in order to decide whether something is yes or no, one or zero, it's usually is a step function. But step function does not really prescribe what nature it is. It's a little bit more fuzzy. So we can use, for example, a hyperbolic tangent where we have a smooth, smoother transition between zero and one. Um, okay, output is compared to large uh, target output to eliminate errors. Error gradients are, are iterated and back propagated to the previous layers. And then we have an activation function and uh, we use classification tasks between multiple exclusive cases of, uh, of uh, sub and maximum or multinomial 
uh, activation. So yeah, it's a pretty complicated thing, but as I said again, we simply deployed an existing machine learning. Okay, this is the other one is uh, support vector mechanisms. What it does is that if we have a hyperspace of parameters, is to convert some of the parameters, lower order parameters to higher order parameters and generate a hyperspace of a carb and pass a plane and that plane should divide the data into above and below the plane. And then the other set is random forest. A random forest which consists nothing more than uh, a multiple of uh, search trees. So trees combined together, of course, makes a forest. So, uh, okay, what can I say about that? So, yeah, multiple decision trees is just a random forest. Okay, so there are many things you need to worry about in machine learning. Number one is you have to, de to decide on the so-called hyperparameters, which control the performance of the, of the, of the um, machine learning. You have to formulate much more, a more diverse measure of, uh, of performance. Usually we just use R squared, right? R squared is not enough. So we have other parameters like accuracy, precision, uh, recall, rec and F1 score. These are parameters that we deploy in order to test whether the machine learning is working. We also use the so-called confusion ma matrix, which is in itself is confusing. Because in prediction, we have what we call a positive and a negative co co prediction. In other words, there's a negative correlation, a positive correlation. But you can predict a positive correlation positively. Or you can predict a positive, positive correlation negatively. Is, is, that, is that getting clear? So th th there is a prediction that something is there or a prediction that something is not there. So this is the so-called uh, confusing matrix, and we do that by testing the different zones of infinite collapse, uh, infinite zone collapse and normal, influence zone collapse in nature. So this is an example of the um, different classes, the three classes of uh, response of the tunnel that we can get, okay, in, as function of the epoch, and with the, both SBM and uh, MLP and RF. This is just a performance. As you can see here already, uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, the last one, the last column, you can see a much better prediction than the other methods. Uh, this is the confusion matrix that we generated. And again, here we could, uh, we could decide which of the um, machine learning algorithms that we have used are performing well. The other column is uh, uh, performance using and training data. There's such thing as so-called over-prediction, okay? Um, if your, your efficiency for training data is less than the efficiency on the testing data, then you are over-predicting. In other words, your prediction, the performance of your prediction can never exceed, for the testing data, or rather for the training data, can never be exceeded by the, data, the performance for the predicted data. In other words, you are over-predicting, okay? Uh, this is another, uh, another uh, graph. We tried, we tried to see whether there is a zone of a certain length. Let's say that uh, L is the length of the collapse zone. We wanted to, to determine whether there is a zone before and after the collapse zone, a certain length, maybe one-fourth of that uh, collapse zone, one-half or the same length of that zone, will tell us whether there is an upcoming collapse. So the horizontal axis here are the lengths of the, of the zone as function of the prediction of the to total collapse. This is a typical example of a, of a confusion matrix. Okay, right. And we are able to apply and test the, the performance on the different lithologies. For example, uh, the green are the normal zones the yellow are the influence zones, and the red are the collapse zones for different lithologies. Okay, all right, so machine learning can significantly improve the analysis and design of tunnels by using enormous amount of real-time monitoring data. As I said, the data we're dealing with are nonlinear, noisy, with high di dimensionality. Machine, machine learning can then 
identify hidden patterns for data-driven predictive modeling. We already have a multitude of uh, machine learning algorithms. All we have to do is deploy them. And, uh, but the challenge is to find which are the best ones for tunneling. As I said, we cannot just pick and choose, but it seems that the three algorithms that we have tried work very well. It is very important to press process the data, to remove the noise, okay? Removing the noise is like quality control. One of the uh, most widely techniques that we use is the six sigma or six standard deviation, which is widely used in, 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 in quality control in manufacturing. So any data outside of the six sigma or six standard deviations are completely taken out because they could be noise. But there are other ways to take out noise from the data. Um, um, okay, it looks like machine learning can be used to, more to, to by a TBM. The goal again is for the, T, the machine learning to be used by a TBM operator in order to influence how he controls the operation. Right now, uh, operation of the TBM relies heavily on the experience of the TB, TBM operator, which is uh, a lot of time is subject to unpredictable response and it's not fully infallible. Um, but machine learning can help improve that. We find that there is, the, uh, there is an influence zone that is before a collapse, there is a certain length of, tunnel uh, of the tunnel that could indicate a potential upcoming collapse zone. For, so for a TBM operator, that's the time to try to find a way to modify the uh, TBM operation. That optimal length of the influence zone is one fourth the length of the collapse zone. So if the collapse zone is about uh, 10 meters and you have about 2.5 meters before that uh, collapse is gonna happen. Uh, we could identify the different zones of collapse, influence and normal, with at least 90% of accuracy with the test data. And the different uh, algorithms we use, random forest seems to be the best one. Um, okay, if you want to get updated on the latest use of machine learning and other information technology in geoengineering, I'm organizing the FIP International Conference on Information Technology Engineering. It will be from August 5 to 8 next year in, the, in our campus in Golden, Colorado. Um, I'd like to apply, uh, acknowledge the IIT Delhi and SJBN for the support to present at this symposium. Tongji University for providing us with the data from their water convenience talents. Uh, China is now really one of the most active uh, countries in tunneling. I, I have lost count of the major projects that they have that involve tunneling. I'd like to thank uh, Shermin Sharna, my previous PhD student, who is now assistant professor at the University of Pacific, Asia Pacific in Bangladesh. And I'd like to thank the Department of Energy in supporting our Center for Underground Transportation Infrastructure. We have been operating for uh, uh, more than six years now. They have been very generous with their support for us to be able to be develop cutting edge technologies that can be applied to tunneling. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention. Now I request Professor G.V. Ramna to extend our gratitude for the enlightening talk by Dr. Marte by giving a memento as a token of appreciation. Thank you. A special thanks to you, sir. You caught up on the lunch time. We are breaking at one sharp for the lunch, and I request that we, sh we should start the session by 2.15 today. Okay, not at 2.30, by 2.15 we shall be back, and uh, we will start that. Now, now I request... Uh J.T. Sau, sir, on stage to extend our gratitude towards Professor G.V. Ramna for his efforts in the coordination and management of this session by presenting a token of appreciation. Thank you, sir.